Today we're going to be looking at different types of operating systems. When we've thought about software in the past, we're thinking about the different programs, the different apps that are installed on the computer. And an operating system is very similar, it's just software that runs on the computer. But the operating system is the thing that is in charge of the different hardware that's on your computer and any other software that is running. So the operating system itself is a platform that allows us to interact with it, but it also allows all of your other applications and programs to run. Now for us as people, it's not as easy to interact with a computer or a device. So we have something called a user interface, which is what we're looking at when we're using the operating system on the device. Now there's different types of user interface. All have got their advantages and disadvantages, and we're gonna look at some of them now. So the first one we're gonna look at is this, a graphical user interface, or GUI, or GUI for short. And what you can see is just uh, all the different icons that help people who may not have much experience using a device, it might make it easier for them to use. Now an easy way to think about this and remember it is something called WIMP. So for the W in WIMP, that stands for Windows, and you've got things like this as a window, which it allows us to interact with it and see different things that we might store or keep in different places. You can move the window around, you can resize it, whatever you want to do with it. The I stands for icons. So like in real life, they try and use pictures and icons that are relatable and can help us remember what we're gonna actually use it for. So for example, I know that if I don't want something anymore, I can put it in the bin. And we've got a, an icon here of a recycle bin because it's relatable, we know what it would be used for. So if I don't want something, I can just move it and put it straight into the recycle bin. So it just allows us to remember what it should be used for and interact with the device in that way. So the M stands for menus. We've got tons of menus in a graphical user interface. For example, when I click on start and go to all my programs, we've got a list here. This is our menu. We've also got different menus when we right click in places of different things that we can do as well. And then finally, we've got the P, which is for pointers. And you can see I've got my nice bright pink pointer so I can see exactly what it is that I want and I can just click wherever the pointer is and I'll be able to access it. Another type of menu is something called a command line interface. An example of a command line interface is command prompt where we can type in commands and still control the device in this way. Other examples would include on a Linux operating system, you could use the terminal. So to use this, you just type in different commands so that you can control it. So for example, if I wanted to change which folder I'm currently looking in, which directory, I can do CD, which is for change directory. I can change to this one, which is what I wanna look at and send in that command. And now that's the directory that I'm looking in. If I wanted to make a directory, I can type in another command, MKDIR, and then give it a name like example one. I'll press enter, send that command in. Let's open that folder now and look, and here is the folder that I've just created using that command. Other examples of user interface would include a menu-driven interface, which is a bit like when you get to a cash machine and your options come up on the screen in front of you, and then you've got different buttons that you would press on to interact with what it is that it says you can do. The final interface we want to talk about is a voice-activated interface. This could be something like Siri, where you would say Siri and then your command, and then it will listen to you, and then it should hopefully do what it is that you've asked it to do. It then might follow up with further questions and get you to interact with it in that way. For your operating system to manage all of this different software, it has to allocate memory to each of these different open applications. Now you can actually see how much memory is being allocated to different applications by doing this. Control or delete on your keyboard, selecting task manager, and you can see what's currently open in this way. You can see at the moment, I'm using about 39% of my memory for the current open applications. You've also got the different background processes which run in the background anyway, which are also using memory, but not as much. Sometimes this is referred to as multitasking. So as you've seen, I've got different applications at the moment that are open. And to do that, the operating system has to multitask and run those different programs at the same time. Now, as we know, all the way back from our hardware unit, we've got the CPU, which is fetching, decoding those instructions that are coming from all the open applications. Multitasking allows that to happen smoothly. And the operating system will interact with the CPU to ensure that that is happening. Okay, let's have a look at a few questions on this topic. So question one, explain the role of an operating system. Question two, identify three types of user interface. And question three, explain what is meant by memory management. OK, 
But let's go through some answers then. So question one was explain the role of an operating system. You could have written something like an operating system is software that manages computer hardware and software resources. You could extend your explanation by saying the operating system provides a platform for applications to run. Question two is identify three types of user interface. So some of the ones we've looked at are graphical user interface, command line interface, and menu interface. Question three was explain what is meant by memory management. So you could have written something like the operating system allocates memory to different applications, transfers data between RAM and storage when needed. And that's In this video, we're looking at system software. In the last video, we looked at operating systems and how it is software that manages both hardware and software resources. System software in this video is referring to the different software and processes that are available as part of your operating system. The first one that I want to have a look at is peripheral management and drivers. So first of all, let's look at what's meant by peripherals. Now, if you think peripheral vision, something that's on the outside, that should hopefully remind you about what is meant by peripheral, which is external devices. It could be things like a keyboard, a printer, a mouse, and so on. As part of system software, you can manage these different devices that are connected and sometimes you need to install an update to make that device work properly. This is also known as a device driver. So a driver is actually software that allows the operating system to correctly communicate with the peripheral. If you connect a device that your operating system has never seen before, it might be that they can't communicate with each other. By installing the correct drivers, it will fix any bugs and allow that communication between the device and the operating system itself. This usually improves performance and enhances its capabilities, but will also fix any bugs that it might have been experiencing as well. Another feature of system software is user management. The operating system allows different users to have separate accounts. Now it might be that different users like having things set up in a different way. So you can personalize your own profile so it's set up in the way that you like. Now, if different people are using the computer, it might be that you want to have different access rights. We've talked quite a lot about access rights in the past when we looked at our networks topic. But as a quick reminder, an admin might have access to more things than a guest might have. The admin might be able to make changes to the computer itself, install extra programs, whereas a guest might just be able to use the things that are already on there, but not make any actual changes to the computer itself. As part of a user management feature, you've also got security features as well. This can be setting up things like passwords, authentication, finger ID, and so on. Another feature of system software is file management. So when you've got your files stored in a hard drive or a solid state drive, it can be quite confusing for us to understand, but how we see it and interact with it is actually really easy. And that's because we store our files in a structured way in folders that we can recognize. So what we're looking at here is a folder that I've got on my computer. This is actually stored in a place on my hard drive. So for us to interact with it, we can click on the file that's inside it and we can perform different actions with it. Most of these actions are across the top here. So we can copy them, we can rename them, we can share them with other people, we can delete them and we can move them. For example, I can drag and drop this one inside here, whereas actually that's changing the location of that on the hard drive. So as a final overview of system software file management, We've got naming, renaming files so they're given easy identification for us. We've got folder allocation so that files are stored in the different directories or folders as we call them. And we can move and save different files. Files can be copied, moved or deleted. And all of this comes under what we call file management. Okay, let's practice some questions on this topic. Question number one, explain what is meant by a device driver. Question number two, identify two features of user management. And question number three, give two advantages to a user of file management. Okay, let's run through the answers then. So question one was explain what is meant by a device driver. You could have put something like software that allows the operating system to communicate with peripherals. They can add extra functionality to the devices. Question number two was identify two features of user management. So we could have gone for security and access rights. And for question number three, give two advantages to a user of file management. I've gone for a user can rename files that would get me one mark so that they can be found and identified easily. So that's your second mark on that first advantage. You also could have gone for files can be stored in folders. That's one mark so that they can be kept organized and found easily by the user. That's your second mark for that one. And in that's this it. video, we're going to be looking at utility software.
Now, as a definition, utility software is system software that helps maintain and optimize a computer. So the first one we're going to look at is encryption software. Now, encryption is a feature that we've come across quite a few times, especially in the networks topic when we're sending information to other people. And it's very similar in this case, but it's just a feature of an operating system to also protect data. So encryption data protects data by converting it into an unreadable code. And like before, if anybody was to intercept it or try and get it, it will prevent unorganized authorized access to see that sensitive data that they might be after. Common examples will include BitLocker and VeraCrypt. If you've not seen BitLocker before, this comes as a feature on Windows computers. And if you plug in something like a, a pen drive, it might give you the option to encrypt the file using BitLocker. And what that will do, it will make it so that anybody else who tries to access that pen drive, it will require a password for them. And if they did manage to access the files without the password, all of it will be scrambled and it will be useless to them. The next one I want to talk about is disk defragmentation. Now this is something that only happens to hard drives. It will optimize the hard drive so that the read and write speed is much faster. Over time, hard drives can become what we call fragmented. Now what that means is that blocks of data of related files are usually stored next to each other on a hard drive. But if a file gets deleted, it might free up gaps on the hard drive. And as a new file is added, if it doesn't quite fit in that gap, it will go across multiple parts of the hard drive. So that now when it's gonna read that information from the hard drive, it's got to look in more than one place to actually access the larger file that's taken up those blocks that became freed up in the first place. Disk defragmentation is the thing that moves the related files back together so it's only looking in one place to see those related files and that will speed up overall access. A final one that I wanna look at is data compression. Now we've looked at data compression before when we were doing our memory units. Data compression reduces the file size. This is good because it will reduce the amount of storage that your files are taking up on the hard drive. But it also means if you're transferring data, it will speed up that process as well because it's got the smaller file size. Another advantage is it makes it faster to send files over the internet. We've got the two types of compression that we've already mentioned, which is lossy compression and lossless compression. One that we didn't talk about was zip folders for lossless compression. So if you were gonna create a zip folder, you would select all of your files, you can right click and put them into a zip folder. This will compress all the files without removing any of the data. This makes it much easier to send to somebody else because the file size is much smaller and you can attach it to an email and send it to somebody over the internet. Okay, let's look at some questions for this topic. So question one, what is the purpose of encryption software? Question two, explain how files may have become fragmented on a hard disk drive. And question three, what are two benefits of data compression? Okay, let's go through the answers then. So question one, what is the purpose of encryption software? So encryption protects data by converting it into unreadable code. Question number two, explain how files may have become fragmented on a hard disk drive. So it was a three marker, so we've gone into a little bit of extra detail on this one. So when files are saved in non-continuous blocks of free space, this will cause parts of the file to be scattered across different locations on the disk. As files are modified or deleted, gaps will form, leading to more fragmentation and making the read-write head take longer to access the data. And question three, what are two benefits of data compression? It saves disk space and it makes it faster to send files over the internet. And that's it for this one. I'll see you next time.